hope you brought your Bibles. Matthew chapter 28 is where we're going to read our story this morning. Matthew chapter 28, and let's read verses 1 through 10. 1 through 10 from Matthew chapter 28. Praise the Lord. If you're there, say amen. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here. Somebody say, Thank the Lord. For He is risen, as He said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead. And behold, He goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren, they go that they go unto Galilee, and there shall they see me. Praise God. Father, thank you for the word of God this morning. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that you are the life. And Lord, I just pray that, Lord, as we have felt and witnessed that presence here, guide us as we look into this story from your word as we once again celebrate your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people say a big amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated this morning. I want to quickly just limit my thoughts to three points, um, and then I will let you go. First of all, I want to share with you the message of Easter. Second of all, the meaning of Easter. And finally, the miracle of Easter. Message, meaning, and miracle. This week, I thought that if there's one Sunday uh, of the year when the preacher's task uh, is relatively easy, this ought to be the one. I mean, there's, there's expectancy in the air. There's uh, an anticipation of uh, larger numbers than normal. And there's an enthusiasm in our worship that uh, encourages and lifts us. As we focus on the season, and there is within us a, a uh, desire, I think, to hear the declaration of life's triumph over death again. Uh, that's, a, that's a message that never gets old. Um, life's triumph over death. And, but, but Easter's message, Easter's message can be kind of a different matter distinct from the Easter sermon. Um, for in spite of all of our uh, expectancy and preparation and anticipation, there, there is something, I, I trying to process it this week, there's something naturally within us that I feel by default it naturally contradicts the message of Easter. Let me qualify my statement because I think it's, it's because deeply embedded Within our human experience, we understand life and then what? Death. But here comes Easter, and it kind of shakes things up a bit by proclaiming the exact opposite death and then. Let's try that again. Easter proclaims death and then. Life. Oh, that's much better. That's why its message seems to sometimes stretch us. And, and that's one reason I, I love its implications so much. Because it calls us as believers to live in 
our world drastically different from the unbelievers who have not embraced the significance of the resurrection. And that's okay because I've answered its call. And, and how many here this morning have answered the call of the resurrection and you say, I'm thankful for new life in Christ. Raise your hands and say, thank the Lord. Praise God. So Easter's message kind of bumps us out of our, our normal comfort zones and, and, and reminds us of how resurrection changed everything. That's its message. That's its message. Secondly, it's meaning. Because I like this because, let me tell you about, I read this week about a little girl by the name of Nicole. Nicole was three years old, uh, was eager for Easter to uh, arrive just as excited about Easter as she would have been Christmas. And as she and her father were uh, out shopping for her new Easter shoes, she said, Daddy, I just can't wait. I can't wait for Easter. And so he asked her, said, Nicole, do you, do you know what Easter means? And her eyes brightened and she said, oh, yes. And without hesitation, both of our arms shot up in the air and she yelled, Surprise! And I kind of like her definition. She said, surprise, Daddy. It means surprise. Because that one word summarizes Easter quite adequately. Because Christ was crucified, buried, and sealed in the tomb. But three days later, surprise. Huh? E even though Christ said He would rise again, no one believed it. So that's why it was a big surprise. The soldiers, I, I thought of them guarding the tomb, were surprised. The Pharisees were surprised. The Sadducees were surprised. They didn't even believe in a resurrection. The disciples, they were even surprised. Their whole Roman Empire was surprised. Old Mr. Death, the powers of evil, were surprised. Sin and sorrow were surprised. On the dawning of that first Easter morning, God announced His surprise for mankind. Christ wasn't staying in that grave, church. He was coming out alive. Thank God. Somebody give Him a hand clap of praise. He's alive this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Friends, I, I was thinking this week, when it comes to what's absolutely imperative in life, church, Christ's resurrection is imperative. It's the critical issue. It's the turning point of human history. And I want you to think with me for a moment, hypothetically, okay, let's say for some reason the government forced a condensing of the Bible by about a thousand verses. Okay, now let's say this is hypothetically, okay, and I don't want to omit one word, much less a thousand verses. Understand me. But if Bible scholars met to abridge the Scriptures, what could be deleted without compromising its integrity? They would probably start, I was thinking this week, with some of the genealogy passages. Don't you love it when you've got to read those during your Bible reading chart? So-and-so begets. So I understand the begets of Scripture are important, but they would, these scholars would probably say, we might be able to get to heaven without knowing who... Mayor Shalahashbaz's third cousin was. What about the passages in Leviticus that outline the priest's protocol for the Jewish temple? Although they are very rich in typology, we're not bound to that mode of worship anymore. So, so we could probably, they, they would say, we might be able to get by without that methodology. How many are following me? But listen, Paul says one non-negotiable. One non-negotiable, untouchable portion of Scripture that must be left intact is that resurrection passage. The Apostle Paul said that if those verses are deleted in 1 Corinthians 15, then he said, all that we believe is invalid. All that we, our entire faith will be vain. Our preaching would be empty. Our preaching would be void. It would mean that what the apostles who said they were eyewitnesses of the resurrection, it would mean they were liars. And it would mean that all of our sin that we thought was dealt with at the cross would still remain. That wouldn't be a good thing. 
But it would mean that death rules and consumes the souls of men when they die. There anything about the Christian faith and all the Bible claims hinge on the resurrection changing everything. All the great stories, all the miracles, all the testimonies, all the prophecies uh, are directly connected with the resurrection and especially the promises of God. How many know every promise from, from the garden uh, in Genesis to the cross on Calvary uh, was literally buried in the tomb with Jesus. Uh, but thank God three days later, uh, over 1,500 promises uh, came out of that grave and is still alive for you and for me. Why? Because up from the grave He arose uh, with triumph uh, over His foes. Uh, and just, just think about it. When Jesus arose, all of those promises arose. That's why 2 Corinthians 1.20 says no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ uh, and they are amen. That means so be it. Uh, and so all God's promises are fulfilled through one person, Jesus Christ. Uh, and without Him, church, they would all be dead. He's the yes and the amen. And Christ is the one in whom God, God's promises are all focused and and fixed and fulfilled and whatever we need is found in Him. And the reason this book right here lives on and the promises pulsate with life is simply because Christ infused His very life with this book. Hello. And so when... You know, I'd, I'd rather put my faith in a promise than dismiss the hope of a miracle and accept defeat. We have a tendency to approach our problems like the women approached Christ's tomb. They were expecting the worst. How many sometimes expect the worst? I raise my hand. Huh? They arrived only expecting to anoint and improve the corpse, but they found God had provided something infinitely better than an improvement. Hello. He provided a resurrection. And a resurrection is what Christ had promised three days earlier. And that's what occurred. Occurred. Now, I have a question. How are you facing the situations that without a miracle is hopeless and impossible in your families? If so, like the, the women walking toward the tomb, are you trying to beautify it? You, are you trying to make it smell better? That's what they were trying to do. Or are you going to stare it down, stare that problem down with faith and expect it to be conquered by the promise of the Word of God? You know what makes that kind of faith possible? The resurrection. The resurrection says if the stone of death has been rolled away, any mountain in our lives can be thrown into the sea. That is the hope of the resurrection. Folks, everything about our faith and future hinge on the resurrection. And when we read the lines of Scripture, we see that Christ tried weeks in advance to prepare His disciples for His death. He forewarned them of His betrayal. He forewarned them of His trial and His crucifixion. Despite His clear warning, folks, how many know they just couldn't grasp it? They couldn't get it. And, and so He said to Himself, no doubt, it's all right, it's all right. I'll have a promise for Him. I'll have a surprise three days later. He predicted how the Sanhedrin would wrongfully convict him. He predicted how the Roman government uh, would sustain their verdict. But still, nobody understood him. Nobody. Peter even rebuked Christ for suggesting the demise of this sort. But Jesus thought to himself, that's all right, Peter. I'll have a surprise for you three days later. And he told the disciples that Satan was behind the sinister plot and there was nothing to fear because after he died, he would have a surprise for them three days later. And when he attended the Passover in Jerusalem, everything began to unfold just like he predicted. He was betrayed. He was tried. He was convicted. He was crucified. But in the end, church, that was just the beginning. 
When he drew his last breath on the cross, he descended, the Bible said, into the regions of the earth, into a place we call paradise. Scripture calls it Adam's, or excuse me, Abraham's bosom, where the souls of the departed saints for years had gone together. And after a couple days of preaching to them, they accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And that's when he announced to them that it was time to revisit Jerusalem and reclaim his body. And he invited, the Bible says, he took all of those souls, he invited all those souls from paradise to go with him. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, the first matter of business was Jesus snatched his body, kicked away that stone, and then stepped out into the dusty streets of Jerusalem and appeared to about 500 individuals over less than 50 days and said, guess what? I told you I'd come back. I said, I told you I'd come back. Raise your hands and say, He's back. He's back. That means that your problems don't have to be problems. When Jesus comes back, that means your situation doesn't have to be a situation because Jesus came back. Hallelujah. Woo! Oh, I just, I just think of history. 1948, Thomas Dewey. He had the presidential election wrapped up. Everyone thought. And everybody said so. The top political experts, according to a Newsweek poll, said that Dewey had a hundred more electoral votes than he needed to win. Newspapers all across the country predicted a landslide for Dewey. Life magazine captioned a picture of Dewey, Dewey with the words, a new president. Chicago Tribune already had the headlines printed. Dewey defeats Truman. On election night, Dewey stayed up working late on his acceptance speech. That's back in 1948. There's some of us that was alive back then. Dewey stayed up late that night. Oh, yeah, he was pumped working on his acceptance speech. Truman spent the night in Excelsior Springs, Missouri. Reports said he ended his night by eating a ham sandwich, drinking a glass of milk, and going to bed, convinced that he lost. But come to find out they were both wrong. Everybody thought it was over. And obviously, when it all came down to it, Truman was elected. But that's not the only time somebody made that kind of mistake. Hello? It was a cool spring night in the city. The high priest, Caiaphas, no doubt planned to go to bed early that night. It had been a long day, a long week. The Jewish high priest had been up before daybreak that Friday to hear the case of this Jesus the Galilean. It had all taken place under the cover of darkness to keep his followers from getting wind of what was happening and no doubt inciting a riot. And as you read the Scripture, the trial went as planned. Witnesses provided ample evidence against Jesus, this troublemaker. The council voted and the verdict was announced. The Roman authorities gave their approval. By 9 o'clock in that, in that morning, Jesus was on His way to the cross. At 3 in the afternoon, it was finished. Sleep would come easy for Caiaphas that night. He was tired. He was also relieved. You see, this Jesus had been causing him a lot of trouble. Over the last few months, His teaching was upsetting the rabbis. Rumors of miracles had all the Jews on edge. And he remembered the hysteria when Jesus the Galilean had been paraded into town to the shouts of the crowd that we celebrated last Sunday at his triumphal entry. Then that same day there was the disturbance in the temple where this Jesus, normally meek and mild, gone on a rampage 
through the temple courts, turning over the tables and chasing out the merchants. How many remember that story? It had been one troubling report after another all week long for Caiaphas. The Roman governor had warned Caiaphas to get that problem under control or they would find a high priest who could. Caiaphas didn't have to be warned twice. Late in the week, the security police made the arrangements. An inside source provided the needed information where Jesus was to be that night. Oh, Jesus is now history. Before going to his sleeping chambers, Caiaphas finished one piece of business. He signed the request for a cohort of Roman soldiers to guard the tomb that night. And the last thing they needed was some honoriness by Jesus' followers. Caiaphas and all the other Jewish authorities went to bed on Friday night content that the Jesus problem was solved. Hello. Caiaphas and all the other Jewish authorities went to bed on Friday night. Saying, whew, glad that's over. They thought it was over, church. But Acts 2.24, but God raised him from the dead. I said, Acts 2.24 says, but God raised him from the dead. Christ's friends thought it was over. Unlike Caiaphas, few of them probably even slept Friday night. Never mind, they had been all up all night before. They had been too heartbroken and too scared to sleep. Their friend, their hero, their teacher had been crucified and scared that they would be the next one. Most of them had scattered by uh, Friday morning and, and, and few had stayed with Christ through the bitter end of the crucifixion scene. They had stood near the cross and watched Him take His last breath and say it was finished. To them, it was over. His followers couldn't just let the Romans dispose of Jesus' body like a common criminal. Joseph requested the, the body to be placed in his tomb. Some women made the quick temporary preparation for the body in, for burial. But doing it right, they would have to come back. They would need to wait until after the Sabbath. But it could wait because in their eyes, he wasn't going anywhere. Huh? On Saturday, some of the followers huddled together in prayer and others quietly began to prepare to go back home to Galilee. They had no reason to stay in the city of Jerusalem, Scripture says. Jesus was gone. Why? Because they thought it was over. Huh? But Acts 2.24. But God raised him from the dead. But they were not the last ones to think that. But because for 2,000 years, church, folks have been making the same miscalculation. Some, like Caiaphas, make themselves adversaries of Jesus. While others make themselves skeptics. Most have been a lot like people we know. Maybe like some of us here. Neither serious followers, but yet we're not outright adversaries. It's not that we don't like Jesus. We just have other pressing matters to take care of. Amazingly, some of us actually approach Easter like it's just another day. What's the big deal? We tell ourselves, you know, Jesus lived. He taught nice lessons about uh, loving your neighbor, forgiving your enemies. Then he died. It's over. No need. No need, Pastor. No need to get all fanatical and radical. Acts 2, 24. But God raised him from the dead. People can do many things with this Jesus. They despise him as a fool. They can uh, oppose him as a killjoy. They could admire his life and teachings. But anyone who thinks that they can dismiss him as unimportant makes a terrible mistake. Every time we date a check, every time we turn a page of our calendars, we give silent acknowledgement that something being happened 2,000 years ago that we dare not ignore, church. And it all hinges on what happened that Easter morning. We may think it's over, church, but Acts 2.24, God raised him from the dead. Woo. 
And those who dismiss Easter is as unimportant are, are not the only ones who make this miscalculation because we live in a world, church, we live in a world that's filled with more than its share of men and women that live their lives ignoring Jesus Christ, uh, cruel dictators, uh, 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 the rule with uh, uh, tyranny and greedy folks trample the poor and many live in selfish indifference convinced that how they live is nobody's business but their own. We only go around once so let's eat, let's drink and let's be merry. How many know that's the motto for our modern culture? Hello, no future, no hope and certainly no judgment. We don't have to answer to anybody. So what? If you try to tell them Jesus is coming back. So what? To, to them Jesus is history. He's gone. It's over. But I have one verse for them. Acts 2.24 But God raised him from the dead. I said, but God raised him. And many are tempted to think that they're finished with Jesus and that everything that matters is over. And to think that way, though, is to make a terrible mistake. While some attempt to dismiss Jesus, others uh, think they are, are done with him. Still others will give up on him. Life isn't always easy. A lot of us struggle with disappointments. A lot of us struggle with heartaches. A lot of us struggle with frustrations. Uh, we can conclude all of those moments uh, that our situation is beyond the reach of Jesus, uh, like the sister of Lazarus. Uh, if Jesus would have been here, uh, things would be different. Uh, but listen, uh, we begin to talk to ourselves and say, but He isn't. He's not here. Uh, he's gone. It's over. But I've got good news for you this morning. Acts 2.24 says, but God raised Him from the dead. That simply means it doesn't have to be over for you. It doesn't have to be over for me. If we think it is. We will dismiss Jesus. We'll give up on Him. We'll give up on ourselves. But to do that is to make a huge mistake. And a lot of folks, maybe some right here in this room this morning, have made some pretty big mistakes in your life. Or maybe some have committed a whole lot of little sins that just keep repeating themselves. Hello. Over and over and over. And we conclude that, listen, I'm going to go to church on an Easter Sunday. I'm going to focus and get my mind off of my problems for a few minutes. But I know as soon as I walk to my car in the parking lot, uh, the problems are still going to be there. Uh, listen, Jesus is great and faith is wonderful and heaven's marvelous, but nope, I don't think it's for me. Uh, it's too late. Uh, I've had my chances and I've messed up. Uh, we Listen, friend. It doesn't have to be over for you. Uh, Acts 2.24 says, But God... But God raised him from the dead. And here lies the miracle of Easter, friend. No one is too bad for God. And no one is too far gone for God. No one, listen, no one is beyond fresh starts. Nobody is beyond new beginnings. Nobody, listen, it's not over until God says it's over. Praise God. God raised him. From the dead. So though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God demonstrated His love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God. Woo! If we didn't have... Some, I hope you don't think I'm too radical this morning. But if I, if I preach this like I felt it, I'd be standing all over the place up here, bouncing off the pews. Huh? Why? Because Easter means it's not over until God says it's over. Hello. You know, I got to close, and I, I know I'm trying to mind. I'm trying to be good. In a German prison camp, World War II, unbeknownst to the guards, History says a few of the American prisoners managed to cobble together a makeshift radio. The prisoners would hide that radio when the Germans came around. They would bring it out at the right time and catch the latest news about the war. That went on for several weeks. Then in the early May 1945, History tells us the Allied broadcast reported that the German high command had surrendered. The war was over. 
However, because of communication breakdown, the word didn't get to the German camp, but it got to the Americans who had the little radio. So the guards knew nothing about what had happened. But among the Americans and other prisoners, the word begins to spread because of the radio that they had heard the pronouncement on. And history says a celebration broke out in that prison camp from one end of it to the other. For the next three days, the guards thought the prisoners had gone mad because here's all these prisoners they're singing, they're waving at the guards, they're laughing at the German shepherd dogs, they're sharing jokes over their meals. The Germans couldn't understand it, but they would. On the fourth day, word finally reached that camp, and the Americans woke up to find all the Germans had fled. And left the gates unlocked. Their time of waiting had come to an end. Here's my point. Not everybody understands Easter. Some out there are puzzled by our celebration in here. But we know that someday... Everybody is going to know it. I said someday everybody's going to know. And what everybody thought it was over. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph over his foes. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friends, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Death has no hold on the lives of the child of God. For Christ tasted death for us and He triumphed over it. I said He triumphed over it. Thank God. Stand with me and give Him a praise. Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. As the musicians come, one of the most moving musical masterpieces of the ages is Handel's Messiah. Although it is synonymous with Christmas, it was really written for Easter. A musician asked someone if they knew which part of Handel's Messiah contained the highest note. And the person guessed, he said, well, it's probably the part where they sing the glory of the Lord or, or the hallelujah chorus, but it isn't. The most exalted note in that masterpiece occurs in the song when they say this line, I know my Redeemer liveth. Praise God. And it reached, that highest point of that song is reached on that phrase, where after that, they say, He's risen. Hallelujah. He's risen. Hallelujah. Think about it. It wasn't placed there by chance. Handel, I believe, knew that the resurrection was the apex of the Christian life. And it changes everything. Listen, friends. Hallelujah. I said it changes everything. And when we allow this resurrected Savior into our lives... We can, too, expect resurrection-like changes. Praise God, Brother George. The alcoholic can expect a change. He will abandon his drink forever. The meth addict can expect a change. He can kick that habit forever. The teenager on the path to self-destruction can expect a change as they reunite with Lord and their parents. Whew. 
Why? Because we've talked about the message, the meaning, but that's the miracle of the resurrection. It's hard it's really hard to argue with a living experience. That's the gospel promise. That's the miracle of the resurrection. On Easter Sunday morning, as every head's bowed and eyes closed, Jesus blew the lock off the prison of death and gloom and returned to His Father. And He opened the way for sinners to find a never-ending satisfaction from His fountain of grace. From the right hand of God, He speaks to everyone today. He invites us to a never-ending banquet in John 6.35. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. He that cometh, into me, cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Thank you, Jesus. Father, today we've celebrated your resurrection. We're going to continue to celebrate throughout this week. But here this morning, if there is somebody under the sound of my voice that needs to make that step from spiritual death over into spiritual life, I pray right here, right now, before they leave this sanctuary, they will be willing to take that step of faith. Hallelujah. Take that step of faith. And ask you into their lives and to put you their first priority. And then let them see the changes that the resurrection can make. Can I speak to those here this morning if you've not embraced the Christ, the resurrected Lord? Please don't leave this service. You can come forward to do it. We would love the opportunity to pray with you or you can remain in your seat because coming forward doesn't necessarily save you. It's a testimony that you're reaching for salvation, but you need to pray a prayer. You need to pray a prayer that consists of about three different simple things. Just as simple as ABC, you need to ask Jesus to come into your life. You need to believe that He is the resurrected Lord and that He died for your sins. You need to confess Him with your mouth and say, I am taking you as my Savior. Please, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. That's not the end, that'll be the beginning. Because God wants to do a lot of things in our lives. And I'm still growing as well as all of us. And He's taken us higher heights and deeper depths. But please, if you're here this morning, don't leave this sanctuary without inviting Jesus into your life. This can be a resurrection Sunday for you and really for your whole family. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. I want some folks that's excited about the resurrected Lord. And you're excited that you're celebrating on the inside here today while others are on the outside. They don't understand it, but they will. (laughs) They will. I want some folks excited about the resurrection. Slip out of your seat. Come to the front and let's just have a few moments of lively praise. Lively praise. Make it easy for those visitors. Maybe you want to slip out of your seat and join us. Find a place at this front to give your heart to Jesus Christ. We want you to do that. God is asking you to do that. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus, church. Just slip up your hands and begin to say, thank you, Lord. I'm alive because you're alive, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. That's it. Folks are coming. Just worship the Lord. That's it. That's it. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Oh, let's celebrate this morning, church. Let's celebrate this morning. He's alive. The tomb is empty. Oh, the tomb is empty. Oh, hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. 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 At the breaking of the door. I give my life to you, Jesus. I give my life to you, Jesus. This is what it's all about. Oh, that's it. Welcome him in. Welcome him. Enthrone him in the throne room of your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's why we celebrate Easter Sunday is because souls can still come to Jesus. He can still make a difference in your life, my friend. He can still make a difference. Why? Because the resurrection changes everything. Your life and mine. Jesus won the victory at the breaking of the dawn. They went running to the tomb, for he was gone. Mary cried and said, My Savior lives on resurrection. 